control of the lectern over to our distinguished postmaster and past district governor, Bob Roman. Are you ready for a humorous speech contest? Yeah. Yeah. As you know, I talked about my wife, or I should say ex-wife, in my talk last year. And there's a couple of things that didn't really make it into the talk, but maybe could have, like words to live by. Don't argue with a spouse who's packing your parachute. <laughs> My son asked me, how much does it cost to get married, Dad? And I said, I don't know. I'm still paying for it. Oh. <laughs> and I, got, I got one more here. Yeah. The only thing my wife and I had in common was that we got married on the same day. Oh. <laughs> I should let you know that day was April 1st. <laughs> Let's make sure we're going to have a good contest here. Everyone is ready. Yeah. I will give the order of the humor speech contest. The first contestant, Dave Patino. The second contestant, Michael Royster. Third contestant, Emily Horwitz. Fourth contestant, Cecilia Clark. The fifth contestant, Stacy Latona. And the sixth contestant, Martina <coughs> Matisse. We will now have the humorous speech contest. Dave Patino, as the crow flies, as the crow flies, Dave Patino. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. My wife and I have been happily married for 16 years. That's the good news. The bad news? We've been married 17. <laughs> now, 16 out of 17 is not bad. That's pretty good. The good average. And it was really only the first year that was tough. We had a transition to go through. A few differences. One of our differences involved travel. We both loved to travel, but it was how we traveled that was different. When I travel, I like to stay in hotels, resorts. I also like to camp. When she travels, she likes to stay at bed and breakfast, B and B. Well, after we got back from our honeymoon and settled into our life, my wife suggested that we take our first trip to a b and together. I had never stayed at a and b but I wasn't too keen on the top. To me, a b and b was musty old house, flowery wallpaper, glazed curtains, a lot of antiques, not my cup of tea. But I wanted to show my wife that I could try new things, I could be flexible, so I said, sure. My only suggestion was that it wasn't so far away. This was just going to be a weekend trip. So a few days later, she came to me. She had an ad for a B&B in Michigan, and it was just two and a half hours away according to the ad. So I said, sure. And two weeks later on a Saturday, we loaded up the car, we filled up our coffee mugs, and off we went to Michigan. We left at 11. We figured that would get us there at 1.30. We'd have a chance to check out the town before we checked out the B&B. It ended up taking us four hours to get there, not two and a half, four. I couldn't understand why. I wasn't driving slow. So when we got there, we walked in, I saw that there were some brochures on the table. I picked one up, and right there on it, it said, from Chicago, two and a half hours. But in parentheses, in tiny little print, it said, as the crow flies. <laughs> as the crow flies? What does that mean? I asked my wife, she had no idea. Sounds like something from the 1800s. So when we checked in, I asked the woman, what does this mean? She said, well, here's Chicago, and here's where we're at, 
And if you were to drive your car diagonally across the lake, or if you were to fly like a crow, you'd be here in two and a half hours. Are you kidding me? Do we look like birds? <laughs> and I don't want to hurt her feelings, but in Illinois, we call cars that drive across the lakes boats. <laughs> and I don't want to make an issue with it. I want to have fun, plus I drank a lot of coffee on the way up. I need to use the restroom. So up to the room we went. Open the door. Bam! There it all is. Flowery wallpaper. Check. Lace curtains. Check. A lot of antiques. Check. Bathroom. <laughs> I didn't see a bathroom. I asked my wife. She looked and said, look around. It's got to be here somewhere. Look around. Where do they hide the bathrooms at B&B's? <laughs> there was clearly no bathroom. So I went to see my friend at the front desk. I said, excuse me. Two quick things. Number one, any suggestions on things to do in the afternoon until dinner time? And number two, while we're out doing those things, can you get a group of workmen, maybe head up to our room and build us a bathroom? Well, it was at that moment that I learned that at this particular bed and breakfast, they have shared bathrooms. Lovely. So I used the bathroom. We went out. We had a great afternoon. Saw the town, went to the beach, came back for dinner. Dinner and breakfast came with the room. Now, I hadn't been to a b and I'm assuming it's going to be a romantic dinner. Candle the dining room, tables for two. As we came down, I saw a large group surrounding one table. <laughs> the second thing I learned about B&Bs, you get to eat with strangers. <laughs> so I made it through dinner. That was fine. The main reason I made it through dinner is I was thinking about after dinner. We were still newlyweds. I was thinking about <laughs> going up to the room and spending some alone time with my wife. There was only one problem. Almost everyone staying at the B&B was a newlywed. And they all had the same idea. And I don't mind that. That's great. I encourage everyone to have as much sex as possible. <laughs> but the problem was we were staying in a 150-year-old farmhouse. <laughs> Paper-thin wall. <laughs> no insulation. You can't imagine the things that we heard. That <laughs> By midnight, the place sounded like the monkey house of Brookfield. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I told you I like camping, right? One of the most disturbing noises you'll ever hear when you camp at night is two raccoons fighting. Shrill noise, scary. Well, either two raccoons snuck into that B&B that night, or one couple got extra frisky. <laughs> <laughs> Finally got some sleep around 1 o'clock. Woke up in the morning, I was starving. And I love breakfast. I'm looking forward to it. It's got to be good. It's in the title, bed and breakfast. <coughs> and eggs. Sausage, pancakes. But first I gotta clean up. So I run down the hall and I wash my face and brush my teeth next to Gary from Kalamazoo. <laughs> and then we head down. On my plate is this thing that I later found out was a raspberry walnut scone. And next to it, this miniature little cup of plain yogurt with granola on it. I said, that can't be it to my plate. There's gotta be more. This has to be. A breakfast appetizer. <laughs> that was breakfast. And the worst part was no conversation. Everyone was so embarrassed about what they heard the night before, they didn't even want to make an eye contact. <laughs> there was a lot of the, can I have the coffee? Good, here you go. And then all of a sudden, a guy at the end of the table asked for the cream. And we all started laughing because we immediately knew that's Raccoon Man from the night before. <laughs> We made, I enjoyed my first time there. We made it through. And since then, we've gone on several trips that have been great because we learned a lesson. We always make a phone call now, and we ask, how long does it take to get there? In a car, <laughs> on a <the> road, <laughs> and when I'm using the washroom, will I be alone, or will someone be sitting next to me? <laughs> but most importantly, just in case they're needed, we always bring a set of earplugs. <laughs> Mr. Toast.
Michael Royster. Down, sit, roll over. Down, sit, roll over. Michael Royster. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and distinguished guests. Down, sit, roll over. What comes to mind when you hear these words? Excellent. That's what I thought as well. What does this have to do with yoga? <laughs> the brochure from the health club said yoga. A fun and easy way to exercise and lose weight. I could lose a few pounds. I signed up for the class, and then they also told me that you have to have the proper attire. So I raced over to the yoga store. They said, now you need yoga pants, yoga shirt, and my yoga headband. <laughs> now I am properly attired. And guess what? All of this cost me only $199.99. <laughs> I entered the class. The instructor said, come to order. We will begin our first pose called Standing Mountain. You stand the feet equally spaced, arms at your side, chest out, head up, and breathe. I like this. <laughs> I can do this all day. <laughs> The next pose, standing hero. Bring your arms over your head, intertwine your arms, lean back, arch your back. Oh yeah, this is great. I love it. I love it. I think I'm losing weight. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, he turned and said, down dog. <laughs> down dog? What type of word is this? <laughs> Who's ever seen a dog down? <laughs> the instructor said, place your hands on the floor, keep your knees straight, bend your body, and place your head between your arms. Look back at your knees. How often have you seen a dog put his head between his arms and look down at his knees? <laughs> Never. If anything, their head will be up and they'll be wagging their tail waiting to go out and play. We must have held this stance for at least 20 minutes. The instructor said it was only 30 seconds. <laughs> Boat was our next. On the floor, hands down to your side, put your legs all the way out in front of you. Well, pretty relaxing. Maybe he's going to have us roll. No. Boat, bring your legs up at a 45 degree angle, then your arms, to make the shape of a boat, now grab your ankles. <laughs> My boat sank like the Titanic. <laughs> the instructor tried to save me. Next pose, happy baby. Happy baby. <laughs> Lie on the floor, bring your knees to your chest, and just rock. <clears throat> now it's been a few years since I've been a baby. And I don't even recall this poll, so maybe I wasn't happy as well. <laughs> I did ask my teenage daughter later that afternoon, does she recall such a pose when she was a child? She looked at me and gave me the look. Yes, I did enjoy that. That was so much fun, just lying on the floor and rolling back and forth. At that point, I remarked, well then, the next time I tell you to clean your room and you give me the look, maybe you should just lie on the floor and rock back and forth. Maybe a little goo-goo sound might help. She gave me the stare and the look. <laughs> back to yoga stances. The next stance was our animal poses. Now, I don't know who comes up with the names of these poses. Cow face legs. Bring your arms out. These are cow's ears. Up, down, depends on your cow. 
<laughs> now, cross your legs, make your knees cross each other, this should be the cow's nose, now squeeze! <laughs> I would call this man in need of a bathroom, fast! <laughs> As I unwound from this particular pose, he said, Eagle. Eagle! Okay, now we can flap. Now we're going good. I can handle this. Instead, he said, Start with your hands out. Now bring them inside. Twist, intertwine. Now twist the legs and crouch. I would call this Eagle, who flew too close to a propeller. <laughs> All in all, I thought I was done. But no, he wasn't through with us yet. One-legged king pigeon. This has got to be easy. It's a pigeon with one leg. What can he do? One leg on the floor, one leg down, one leg in back. Now, throw your head back like the king, arms back like the wings of a pigeon, now, bring that leg, grab that leg, and bring it up to your head. Pigeon down! <laughs> As I stumbled and managed to get back to my feet, and my nerves and my muscles start twitching, he said, class has been dismissed, and we'll end with the traditional yoga salute of namaste, which means I bow to you and a connection to one another. I, the only connection I wanted was to the bakery I saw on my way. <laughs> <laughs> on my way to that bakery, I did see a dog in the grass, stretching and rolling over. Do you know what came to mind? I wonder how long he's been practicing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Horowitz, book smart, street stupid. <laughs> book smart, street stupid, Emily Horowitz. Do you believe in unicorns? Well, until I was 16 years old, I didn't even know that that was a question. I just assumed unicorns were real and that they were from another country. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. This girl, she's kind of a little stupid. <laughs> but I'm here today to tell you that that's not entirely true. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our most welcomed guests. I grew up in an affluent community on Long Island, New York, where I was raised to believe that I was the most beautiful, the funniest, and the smartest girl in all the land. Just like every other little girl on Long Island was raised. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I didn't ever win a beauty pageant. 
I was never voted class clown, but I did live up to my parents' expectations when it came to smarts. The report cards I brought home from middle school through high school were covered in A's and told me I was smart. This notion that I was smart was furthered by the fact that at the end of high school, I received an academic scholarship to a four-year university, which I completed in three years, graduating magna cum laude with honors with a bachelor's degree in accounting. Pretty smart, right? I was impressed. <laughs> Not only that, but after college, within days, I landed my first full-time big girl job, where I was hired as the youngest auditor in the company. However, I quickly learned as I entered the real world that there's two kinds of smarts. There's book smart, and there's street smart, or what some of the experts call common sense. <laughs> and it turns out that I am severely lacking common sense. <laughs> I'll never forget that day when I was 16, and I was sitting in, in my honors English class, and the teacher was going around the room asking the students if you could go anywhere and study abroad, where would you go and why? And from my prime seat in the front row, I eagerly raised my hand. And when I was called on, I exclaimed, I would go to Australia so that I could ride a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> it took about that long for the class to burst out laughing. And I realized they thought that I was joking. Emily, the teacher said, that's a wonderful fantasy if we lived in a fairy tale, but really, where would you go and why? Her words resonated in my head. Fantasy. Fairy tale. Did I miss something? <laughs> but then I thought about it. Had I ever really seen a unicorn? <laughs> Besides a cartoon on television? <laughs> and folks, right then and there <clears throat> was when it hit me. Unicorns are Fiction. <laughs> now I get why everyone was laughing. Unfortunately, these moments of clarity, or when common sense would slap me in the face, they, they never cease to show up out of nowhere. Remember that big girl job I told you about? Well, in my first year, I was involved in something called the office carpool. Ever be involved in one of those? It's amazing. <laughs> it's my turn to drive. It's 5, 5.30 in the evening, and the roads are terrible. People are swerving in and out of lanes, cutting me off. I'm getting real frustrated, and I shout to my coworkers in the car, Jeez, why is everybody rushing? My coworker calmly said, Emily, it's just the hour of the day. And right then and there, it hit me. Rush hour. <laughs> I was sitting in a management class, and I knew I was really smart to be in this class because I was the youngest manager in the company at the time. And I was determined to participate in as many conversations as I could and make friends with all these other managers. So I was really excited when the conversation turned to my favorite topic, coffee. Folks were talking about how much they love drinking coffee, how much they love to have donuts with their coffee, and how much they love to dunk their donuts into their coffee. Well, I exclaimed, I too love dunking donuts in coffee. And right then and there, it hit me. Dunkin' Donuts! <laughs> now I get the store name. <laughs> now I promised you I would tell you I wasn't completely stupid. And you're probably thinking, wow, this poor girl's parents. They saw those report cards. They thought she had so much going for her. She was going to change the world. But don't worry, they knew what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> Long before I ever did, they knew that I was severely lacking common sense. My dad loves to tell this story of when I was 17 and I wanted to go to a party and take the family car. And before he'd give me the keys, he had to do his obligatory parental building. And he said, Emily, will there be parents at this party? And I said, no, Dad, there will not be parents at this party, because I was not his kid. And he said, Emily, will there be drinking at this party? I said, yes, Dad, there will probably be drinking, but I will not be drinking because I'm the designated driver. <laughs> and then in a much more serious tone, he said, Emily, will there be drugs at this party? 
And I wittily replied, yes, Dad, there will be tons of drugs at the party. <laughs> he did not like that. So he had some follow-up questions. And he said, well, what kind of drugs? And I said, you know, Dad, the hard stuff, like pot and marijuana. <laughs> he gave me the keys to the car, kissed me on the cheek, and said, have a great night. I guess he figured that if I didn't know pot and marijuana were the same thing, I wasn't going to be getting into too much trouble. <laughs> there have been many hints of my lack of common sense along the way. I may be able to read a novel in a weekend, analyze financial statements, and solve complex mathematical equations, but some of the most basic things go right over my head. So don't be fooled by my education background, my work experience, or my astute attitude. Because deep down, I'm just a little girl from Long Island who takes way too long to get a joke and still has faith that unicorns are real. <laughs> Mr. Christmas. <laughs>
how do they cut pineapple if it doesn't come from pine or apples? And then one day we were baking, I was baking cookies. We were in the living room and he says, Honey, your cookies are ready. How do you know? Because the alarm went off. The alarm went off. Off. Off to me means off. Nothing happens. So you think the alarm is off. Honey, the alarm is off. No, it's not on. I can listen. It's on. It's not on. It's off, not on. It's off, on, off. Oh my God. So he said, you know what? Just leave it. English is the way it's learning the way it is. All right. That's part of my friend. That's part of marriage. Communication. Then the second part of marriage, the second stage is as the ones who are married here. So you marry the girl or the girl. You don't, not only marry the girl or the girl, you marry the family, the in laws. So one day we went to Peru to visit my English, my family, actually, his English. Because my big um, uncle, John, Latin, Spanish, aggressive, emotional, opened the big door and said, Oh, my family from Chicago! He looked at me, Oh, my niece from Chicago! He grabbed me, kissed me. Oh, my nephew from Chicago! He grabbed my husband, kissing his forehead. My husband, I love you, I love you too, but just, <laughs> you know, like a good American, they don't, don't touch it, yes, it's okay, that's fine, I love you too. <laughs> so my <clears throat> uh, uncle, like English is a second language, he says, well, I will, come in, come in, I'm going to introduce the, fam the, the family. My husband's name is Dennis, I love Dennis, so my uncle would keep calling him, how are you doing, Denis? Denis. Come on, Denis. Let me introduce you to the family, Denis. Would you like something to drink, Denis? All night long, he keep calling me Denis. So my husband says, okay, that's family. We live with it. You know, it's part of marriage. Now I told my friend, you know, marriage is always fun. And the funniest part begins when kids <coughs> come along. After three years of marriage, we have our first kid, Danny. Daniel now is nine years old. And like nine years old, and you, that was the part, is we bottle, put him in bed. You know, we do the, the bookie time, the bedtime, everything, but it's always kids are fighting. They don't want to go to bed. They want to just keep playing until they collapse. <laughs> so one night, my husband put him in bed, and five minutes later, we were relaxing in the living room, and Daniel, Daddy! husband. Daddy, it's time to go to bed. Lights out. Good night. Daddy, what? I'm thirsty. And he says, Daddy, I told you, if you had your chance, that's it. Five minutes later. Daddy, Daddy, my husband, what? I'm thirsty. Can I have a glass of water? My husband says, Daniel, you call me one more time. I'm going to go to your bedroom, go and pick your game, and that's it. So that's it. Let night out. And then five minutes later, Daddy! My husband, yes! When you come, come to come pick my game, could you please bring me a glass of water? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I told my friend. That was long and laughs. Thank you. <laughs>
sucking on a lemon. Or <laughs> sucking on a lemon. <laughs> Casey Latoma.
In my 12-year-old mind, I kind of thought there was something else to her secret to this longevity. And one day, my suspicions were confirmed. I was chewing on some hard candy and happened to cut the inside of my cheek. I went to Yaya for help in helping curing my cheek. She took me by the hand, took me up to her room, closed the bedroom door, opened her closet, reached on the shelf and around and produced a bottle of clear liquid. Immediately I thought, lemon juice. <laughs> but it didn't have that cloudy consistency. And then I thought, well, maybe it's holy blessed lemon juice. <clears throat> Until I read the label. My 4 foot 11, 85 pound grandmother had stashed away a bottle of ouzo. <laughs> she went to her nightstand, pulled out a shot glass, poured me a shot of ouzo, reached in her pocket, took out a half a lemon wrapped in aluminum foil, <laughs> squeezed the bottle of drops, and told me to swig the thing. That's when I heard her story of how she had used this liquor concoction all her life to cure anything from headaches to toothaches to fighting colds. I cook with lemons often. I like to think I work hard. And from time to time, I do take a shot of ouzo. <laughs> so a while back, my ancient instincts kicked in, and I did some mathematical calculations. And I figured I would live to be 150, still sucking on that lemon. <laughs> Sergeant Smiles Raiders. Martina and Matisen were, were Sergeant Smile Raiders. Do you have someone in your life that you would just love to impress if you could? I've got someone like that. Her name is Florence Gianola, Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and our guest today. Florence Gianola is the banker at my bank. She's always, always just put together. She's smart, she's quick, and she's wise, and she loves to share her wisdom with me. She'll say things like, Martina dear, remember that your children are always watching, lead by a good example. See what I mean? Good, wise advice. She gave me little pieces of advice, too, that make sense. For example, when someone gives you a compliment, dear, you don't make excuses, you don't dispute it. You elegantly and simply say, thank you. Also good advice. You can see why I wanted to impress her. One day I had an appointment with Mrs. Ginola at the bank, and I wanted to be put together, and I wanted to be on time. And it wasn't that long ago that I thought the secret to being on time was superior rushing skills. <laughs> One time, I was in such a rush that I threw my toothbrush in the sink, spit in the drawer. <laughs> rushing is not the secret to being on time. Planning ahead is, of course. Now, this is what it looked like back then when I was leaving the house. I had three little kids at the time. They were two years old. One, two, three. They line up behind the safety gate at the top of the stairs, and I pick them up one at a time to take them into the van. Put them on my pip, give them a little smoochie, and we go down the stairs, in the garage, into the van, and I put them in his car seat. 
But when I did that, those two would be crying. They thought I left. But then he would cry, and she would cry, and they would all cry. It was a crying convention. <laughs> so what would Mrs. Gianola tell me to do? Sing there, of course. Then they wouldn't think I left. But the problem is, I can't sing at all. But it worked. And they stopped crying, but my neighbors started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> the day of the appointment, I had my, my bags packed, prepared for every eventuality. And they were clean, polished, and ready at the top of the stairs. And I pick one up, put him on my hip, give him a little smoochy, and you know the drill. We go down the stairs. We're Sergeant Spidey's Raiders, we're Raiders of the Night, into the garage. We're happy little children who would rather play than fight. And I buckle them up, and I see something in the back of my van. It had a furry hump and a ring tail. Oh my gosh, you know what I did? I left a raccoon in my van overnight. My son, I've got, oh, what stopped me was a seatbelt. It knocked me right out of the van, and I landed in a box, a big stiff cardboard box that was filled with bottles of waste oil. Oh. And while I'm bottom down, beat up in a box, my son, he's tied into his car seat with a trapped raccoon overnight. <gasps> what if he starts to cry? I, okay, I gotta be calm. I gotta use a calm voice. I'm gonna sing so we won't cry. What would the raccoon do? <gasps> I'm trapped in my box. I gotta get out of here. We're so just mighty raiders. We're raiders of the night. <laughs> I can't get out. I'm gonna launch myself onto the floor and knock off that box, and I'm and I'm free. Now, everyone knows that a mother separated from her child and perceiving danger would just crunch up her way out of the box and then leap, pop, into a single bound, and then just walk in. I'm on the floor, slipping in grease, and I get up and I'm all, you know, sticky, but I'm free. Now I'm gonna go into the van. Did I see that raccoon's face? Did it have foam dripping from its mouth? I don't know. I've got to go in quietly. So I get my, my boy out and I hold him to me. And then I look. And I lock eyes with the beast. He was the fattest, happiest, most lethargic raccoon you have ever seen. <laughs> There's my snack bag. I love those groceries I forgot from yesterday. He's sitting in them. Eating the whole time, all night long. <laughs> he couldn't walk any faster than he could waddle. If this wasn't real, he'd be picking up his cell phone. Hello, calling his friends. Hey, Ralphie, come on over. I scored big at this garage. <laughs> no threat there. But you know, the car seats, they're clean. I can make my appointment if I employ superior rushing skills. <laughs> And I know how to do that. Put the boy back. We're Sergeant Spiders, Raiders, we're Raiders of the Night. We're happy little children. Go to the kitchen, spaghetti pot lids. We'd rather play than fight. Back into the garage, singing rock party. Boom, boom, boom. Get out of the van. <clears throat> it's not in a hurry. I am. He's got nowhere to go. He <laughs> just waddles out. He looks back over his shoulder as if to say, What's with the noise? That's uncalled for. And you know, you had nothing to drink in the van. Get out! So he's out, and I gotta get the kids in. So what do we do now? Well, come on, baby, hold on to my neck, and we'll just sing that song later, Smoochies later. Come on, we're gonna go into the van, everybody. At the same time, boom, 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 they're in. Ooh, better lock them in. The car seats, they're all locked in. Now I can make it. Ooh, but I'm a mess. Can't leave like this. Laundry room. Here's what we'll do. Get out of the old pants, put fresh ones on. Take off the old top, get rid of it, and, oh, no tops, that's okay. Put on the jacket, zip it up, and <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> so I've got to get in the van on my side, get in, and take off and drive to the bank, white knuckles, because I really want to make it. And observing all of the laws of physics and most traffic laws, I made it. So now I'm going to ask you, was I on time to the bank? Yes. 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 <laughs> I was. But I'm not in yet. Got to get the stroller because you cannot leave your children in the car that is illegal and unsafe. Whoop, I think I packed that one in upside down, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no little round. We've got to take this ramp up to the bank, walk into the door. Zip, chuck the zipper. <laughs> <laughs> Who greets me? 
Mrs. Genova. How lovely to see you. Martina, dear. I can't help but mention, you're on time and all put together. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We have accounted for all the ballots.
I am part of the Masters of Opportunity Club that meets at the Schaumburg Library in about nine years or so. And then what's your highest uh, level of achievement to Masters? Uh, CEO. Something leader. <laughs> Your interests show us Toastmasters and reading and sports and eating. Is it all about from bed and breakfasts? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're a claims operations manager? Or? Yeah, I never like to bring it up. You know, almost everybody in the audience has had a bad uh, situation with the insurance company, but um, I work as an operations manager on the claims side for a large insurance company. And then it was interesting your story on the bed and breakfast. Have you ever gone to anyone that really had a good breakfast? Yes, yes. Over the last 17 years, it seems like a lot of them have upgraded. Uh, Adam Blasher, <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend it. Well, on behalf of the Toastmasters, uh, we offer you this participation certificate. Thank you.
club you're representing and how long you've been with Toastmasters? I'm representing NGC, the North Grumman Toastmasters, a corporate club in Lolly Meadows. And I've been with Toastmasters six years, first in the shower, last opportunity is an energy club. And I see that you're one of your uh, interests is yoga. <laughs>
Division Governor John Lobby to the lectern. <coughs> Lots of names that were not Smith. <laughs> <laughs> to put on a contest like this, with all its many moving parts, takes almost a whole village. I want to begin by thanking all of the club officers who pushed your club members to stretch themselves to compete. Mm -hmm. Without the competitors and without the strength of this field, we would not have had anywhere near the quality of contest that we have. I would also like to recognize all of the different functionaries. Actually, I do recognize them all because they're all friends. I would like to acknowledge Christina Parhas and Leah Giocaros, who were the better two-thirds of our contest committee. Amy Sumatos, Dean Glosson, and Jennifer McAllister, who served as sergeants at arms. <laughs> Big timer Glenn Reed, assisted ably by distinguished Toastmaster Valerie Fuson. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I have a lot of thanks to Leah Jukaris for arranging the smorgasbord at the back of the room. <laughs> And on that note, oh, I should thank one other highly important all of you, <laughs> whose responses and rapt attention made the energy that our speakers fed from as they spoke this afternoon. They could not have done what they did without you. So thank you all. but there are trophies at the front of the row. <laughs> and trust me, these are really fine trophies. They're much better than the one I got a couple of years ago. Uh, <laughs> third. I would like to ask our three district leaders, Donna Weston, Michelle Cable, and Joan Moore, to come forward and help present the trophies. begin with the evaluation contest, and those trophies are the ones on the left. So if you'll arrange yourselves in whatever order you choose, I will make sure that I hand to you the correct certificates, because if I don't do that, we're going to have real problems. So, where are we? Who has first? First is at this end? Well, of course we have to go home. Well, I guess of course. All right. In the category of speech evaluation, third place, please applaud Peter Russell. And that second place finisher is Diane Bullock. Yes, I do, and that person. 
And now, may I announce the person who will do absolutely everything possible to not be hit by a bus between now and our district conference on October 27th, the winner and new division champion for speech evaluation, Linda Annegenberg! Anymore. 
please open my emails when I ask for volunteers. It takes a lot of people to do the job. Please volunteer to work with me at the registration chair. See you at the conference. All right. Library, October 16th, doors open at 5.30. Well, let me know if you have any information. I do plan to send out a flyer to the division governors. We will send it, send it on. Okay, right, thank, thank you. you. That's October 16th. As they say, speak now if ever hold your peace. Lee Ping, tonight, College of Complexes, speaking about communication and democracy. Fellow Toastmaster, come on and come all to see him. Excellent. Peter, one last thing? One last thing. Can I do it from back here? Sure. Yeah. On October 30th, JSC Toastmasters is the sponsor of Social Mixer. We invite all the Toastmasters that are here. It'll be at the Fox and Hounds on Dundee Road in Arlington Heights. It starts at 7 o'clock. It goes till 10. JSC Toastmasters. You're all welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Being no other objections, you're all now man and wife. Have a great uh, weekend.